السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Our lecture is about the trauma from occlusion and also we'll discuss the forces applied on the periodontium and their adverse effect and the tissue response to these forces. The adaptive capacity of the periodontium. The periodontal ligament has a cushioning effect on forces applied to teeth. As mean, it's to accommodate forces exerted on the crown. Due to the elastic nature of the periodontal ligament, all teeth with normal bone support present with physiologic mobility in all directions. But this physiologic mobility varies among individuals and within the dentition of the same individual. In the absence of excessive occlusal forces, or the absence of reduced bone support induced by inflammatory periodontal disease, tooth mobility remained unchanged due to the fact that the physiologic force are not able to induce changes to the periodontal tissue. But when there is an increase in the occlusal force, changes occur in the periodontium in order to accommodate for such forces. The changes in the periodontal ligament or in the periodontium depend on the magnitude, direction, duration, frequency of increased occlusal. The effect of the magnitude of the force. When the magnitude of the occlusal forces is increased, the periodontium responds with widening of the periodontal ligament space in an increase in the number and width of periodontal ligament fibers and increase in the density of alveolar bone. Changing the direction of occlusal force also causes a reorientation of the stress and strain within the periodontium. The principal fiber of periodontal ligament are arranged so that they best accommodate the occlusal force along the long axis of the tooth. The forces that is lateral or horizontal force and the rotational or the torque forces are more likely to injure the The response of the alveolar bone is also affected by the duration and the frequency of the occlusal forces. Constant pressure on the bone is more injurious than the intermittent forces. The more frequent the application of an intermittent force, the more injurious the force is to the periodontium. Trauma from occlusion is defined as microscopic alteration of periodontal structure in the area of the periodontal ligament that become manifest clinically as the elevation of tooth mobility. An inherent or a margin of safety that is common to all tissue permits some variation in occlusion without adversely affecting the periodontia. However, when occlusal forces exceed the adaptive capacity of the tissue, tissue injury will result. The resultant injury is termed trauma from occlusion, which is also known as occlusal trauma. Thus, trauma from occlusion refers to the tissue injury rather than the occlusal forces. An occlusion that produces such in injury is called traumatic occlusion. Excessive occlusal forces may also disrupt the function of the master masticatory musculature and cause painful spasm, injury to the TMJ, or produce excessive tooth wear. However, the term trauma from occlusion is, general, is generally used in the connection with injury to the periodontium. Classification of a trauma from occlusion It's either classified according to the injuries, occlusal forces, mode of onset, to acute or and chronic, or according to the capacity of the periodontium to resist to the occlusal forces primary or secondary occlusion. The acute trauma from occlusion refer to the periodontal changes 
associated with an abrupt occlusal impact as produced by biting on a hard object, example olive bit. In addition, restoration, prosthetic appliance that interfere with or alter the direction of the occlusal forces on teeth also induce acute, acute trauma. Results, acute trauma results in tooth pain, sensitivity to percussion, increased tooth mobility. Also, it may produce cementum tear. If force is dissipated by shift in the position of the tooth or by wearing away or correction of the restoration, the injury will heal and the symptoms subside. But when the periodontal injury may worsen and develop into necrosis accompanied by periodontal abscess formation, or it may persist as symptom-free chronic condition. Chronic trauma refer to the periodontal changes associated with a gradual change in occlusion produced by tooth wear, drifting movement, extrusion of teeth in combination with parafunctional habits as bruxism and clenching. Rather than a sequelae of acute, period, uh, acute periodontal trauma, chronic trauma is more common than the acute one and it's of a greater clinical significance. The criteria that determines if an occlusion is traumatic is whether it's produced periodontal injury. It's not based on how the teeth occlude. Any occlusion that produces periodontal injury is traumatic. My occlusion is not necessary to produce a trauma periodontal injury because periodontal injury may occur when the occlusion appears normal. The dentition may be anatomically and aesthetically acceptable but functionally injurious. Similarly, not all malocclusions are necessary injuries to the periodontia. The traumatic occlusion relationship are referred to by such terms to occlusal disharmony, functional imbalance, and occlusal dystrophy. These terms refer to the effect of the occlusion on the periodontium rather than to the position of the teeth, because trauma from occlusion refer to the tissue injury rather than occlusion. What increase in the occlusal forces is not traumatic if the periodontium can accommodate it. The primary and secondary trauma from occlusion. As mentioned previously, trauma from occlusion can also be classified according to the capacity of the periodontium to resist the occlusal forces into primary and secondary trauma. In other words, trauma from occlusion may be caused by alteration in the occlusal force and a reduced capacity of the periodontium to withstand the occlusal force or both. When trauma from occlusion is the result of alteration in the occlusal force, it is called primary trauma from occlusion. There is no reduction in the periodontium, no loss in the attachment. When it results, from the reduced ability of the periodontium to withstand the occlusal forces, it is known as secondary trauma from occlusion. Primary trauma from occlusion occur if a trauma from occlusion is considered the primary etiologic factor in periodontal destruction and if the only local alteration to which a tooth is subjected is the result of occlusion. Example, a periodontal injury produced around teeth with a previously healthy periodontium after uh, the insertion of high filling, insertion of prosthetic replacement that create excessive forces on abutment and antagonist teeth, 
a drifting movement or extrusion of the teeth into spaces created by unreplaced missing teeth or the orthodontic movement of teeth into functionally unacceptable position. But most studies of the effect of trauma from occlusion involving experimental animals have examined the primary type of a trauma. Changes produced by the primary trauma do not alter the level of connective tissue attachment and do not initiate pocket formation. This is probably because the supracrystal gingival fibers are not affected and therefore prevent the apical migration of junctional epithelium. The secondary trauma from occlusion occur when the adaptive capacity of tissue to withstand occlusal forces is impaired by bone loss that result from marginal inflammation. This reduces the periodontal attachment area and alter the leverage of the remaining tissue. The periodontium become more vulnerable to injury and previously the well-tolerated occlusal force become traumatic. Here, normal periodontium with reduced height. And also, here, a marginal periodont periodontitis caused reduced in the periodontium. Both of them are, when subjected to occlusal forces, this trauma called the secondary trauma from occlusion. We have different types of forces applied on teeth. First, the physiologic force. Physiologic force uh, in chewing, swallowing, it is small and rarely exceeding 5 newton, and they are, uh, provide the positive stimulus to maintain the periodontium and the alveolar bone in a healthy and functional conditions. The second one is the impact force, which is mainly high but of short duration. The periodontium can sustain such forces during a short period. The continuous force is of very low force, as in orthodontic forces, but continuously applied in one direction and are effective in displacing the teeth by depending on the remodeling of the alveolus. Forces in one direction or the orthodontic uh, forces, bodily or tipping forces, produce distinct area of pressure and tension. The last one is the jiggling forces, which is intermittent forces in two di uh, different directions, as in premature contact, for example, crowns, fallings, result in widening of the alveolar bone and increased uh, tooth mobility. In drinking force, the pressure and tension zone coexist in the same site, while in the orthodontic forces, as you see in this draw, that the pressure side and the opposite is the tension side. Now, the stages that uh, explain the tissue response to increase occlusal forces. Tissue response occur in three stages. Injury, repair, adaptive remodeling. Stage one is the injury. Tissue injury is produced by excessive occlusal forces. The body then attempts to repair the injured tissue and restore the periodontium. This can occur if the force are diminished or if the tooth drifts away from. If the offending force is chronic, the periodontium is remodeled to cushion its impact. The ligament is widened at the expense of the bone which result in angular bone defect without periodontal pocket, and the tooth become loose. Under the force of occlusion, a tooth rotates around a fulcrum, or axis of rotation, which is encircled rooted teeth located 
in the junction between the middle and the apical third of the tooth. While in the multi-rooted teeth, it is in the middle of the interradicular bone. This creates areas of pressure and tension on opposite side of the fulcrum. Different lesions are produced by different degrees of pressure and tension. If jiggling forces are exerted, different lesions may coexist in the same area. Pressure side, tension side. Pressure side and tension side. An area of injury with a slightly excessive pressure will stimulate the resorption of the alveolar bone with the resultant widening of the periodontal ligament space. While in the tension, there will be elongation of the periodontal ligament fibers and the opposition of alveolar bone. In area of increased pressure, the blood vessels are numerous and reduced in size, while in the tension, they are enlarged. In area of greater pressure, it will produce a gradation of changes in the periodontal ligament. Starting with compression of the fibers, which is a produced area of hyalinization. Subsequently, injury to the fibroblast and other connective tissue cells lead to necrosis of area of the ligament. Vascular changes are also produced. Within 30 minutes, there will be impairment and stasis of blood flow, and at 2 to 3 hours, blood vessels appear to be packed with erythrocyte, which start to fragment, and between 1 and 7 days, disintegration of blood vessels will and release the content into the surrounding tissue. In addition, there will be increase in the resorption of the tooth surface. In area of severe tension, there will be a widening of the periodontal ligament, thrombosis, hemorrhage, tearing of periodontal ligament, resorption of alveolar bone. Pressure, when a pressure severe enough to force the root against bone will cause necrosis of periodontal ligament and bone. The bone is reabsorbed from viable periodontal ligament adjacent to the necrotic area وأيضاً يصير بريزوربشن from the more spaces وهذه الظاهرة اللي نسميها undermining resorption يعني البون يصير بريزوربشن from two sides The area of the periodontium that are most susceptible to injury from excessive occlusal forces is the forcation and injury to the periodontium produce a temporary depression in the mitotic activity and in the rate of proliferation and differentiation of the fibroblast and in collagen formation as well as in bone formation. And these changes return to normal level after the dissipation of the forces. The injury phase shows increase in the area of resorption while a decrease in the bone formation. Stage 2 is the repair. Repair occurs constantly in the normal periodontia. And the trauma from occlusion stimulates the increased reparative activity. In, reparative, in, in repair stage, the damaged tissue are removed and the new connective tissue cells and fibers bone cementum will be formed in attempt to restore the injured periodontia. Forces remain traumatic only as long as the damage produced exceed the reparative capacity of the tissue. The repair phase demonstrates a decrease resorption and increase formation of the bone. When bone is resorbed by excessive 
cruiser forces, the body will attempt to reinforce the thin bone tropically with a new bone. And this attempt to compensate for the lost bone is termed as buttressing bone formation. And it is an important feature of the reparative process associated with trauma from occlusion. It also occur when bone is destroyed by inflammation or the osteolytic tumors. Buttressing bone formation occur within the jaw, central buttressing, and on the bone surface, the peripheral buttressing. During central buttressing, the industrial cells deposit a new bone, which restores the bone tropically and reduces the size of the marrow spaces. Peripheral buttressing occurs on the facial and lingual surfaces of the alveolar plate. Depending on its severity, peripheral buttressing may produce a shelf life thickening of the alveolar margin, which is referred as lipping or a pronounced bulge in the contour of facial and lingual bone. Cartilage-like material also sometimes develop in the periodontal ligament or uh, we have a formation of a crystals from the erythrocyte is also demonstrated uh, during this stage. As you see, there, is, there will be a widening in the periodontal ligament space uh, at the cervical area and uh, this results in a chronic prolonged trauma from occlusion in rats and I'll slide that ma'khuda after they induce trauma from occlusion on animals. This is the picture of how the buttressing bone formation appear intraorally. After adaptive remodeling of the periodontium, resorption and formation of the bone return to normal. The effect of insufficient occlusal forces also is traumatic. It may also injury to the supporting periodontal tissue. It causes thinning of the periodontal ligament, atrophy of the fiber, osteoporosis of the alveolar bone, and reduction in bone height. The hypofunction also can result from an open bite relationship or absence of functional antagonism or unilateral chewing habit. The reversibility of a traumatic lesions. Trauma from occlusion is reversible. When trauma is artificially induced in experimental animals, the teeth move away or intrude into the jaw. When the impact of the artificially created force is relieved, the tissue undergo repair. Although trauma from occlusion is reversible under such condition, it doesn't always correct itself. And therefore, it is not always temporary or of limited clinical significance. The injurious force must, must be relieved for repair to occur. If conditions in a human do not permit the teeth to escape from the adapt of, uh, to excessive uh, uh, occlusal force, the periodontal damage persists and worsens. The presence of inflammation in the periodontium, as a result of plaque accumulation, impair the reversibility of traumatic lesion. The relationship between plaque-induced periodontal disease and the trauma from occlusion. Numerous studies have been performed that have attempted to determine the mechanism by which trauma from occlusion may affect the periodontal disease. 
Trauma from occlusion in a human, however, is the result of force that act alternatively on opposing the direction. These were analyzed in experimental animals with jiggling forces, which were usually produced by high crown in combination with orthodontic appliance that would bring the traumatized teeth back to its original position when the force was dissipated by separating the teeth. Another method, teeth separated by wooden or elastic material wedge interproximally to displace the teeth toward the opposite proximal side. After 48 hours, the wedge are removed and the procedure was repeated on the opposite side. These studies result in combination of changes produced by a pressure and tension on both sides of the tooth, increase in the width of the ligament, increase in tooth mobility. But none of these methods cause gingival inflammation or pocket, and the result essentially represent different degrees of functional adaptation to increase forces. To mimic the problem in human more closely, studies were then conducted on the effect produced by jiggling trauma and simultaneous plaque-induced gingival inflammation. The accumulation of bacterial plaque that initiate gingivitis and result in periodontal pocket formation affect the marginal gingiva. But trauma from occlusion occur in the supporting tissue. and doesn't affect the gingiva. The marginal gingiva is unaffected by trauma from occlusion because its blood supply is not affected. Even when the vessels of the periodontal ligament are obliterated by excessive occlusal trauma, excessive occlusal forces. It has been repeatedly proved that trauma from occlusion doesn't cause pocket or gingivitis, and that is also doesn't increase gingival fluid flow. Furthermore, experimental trauma in dogs doesn't influence the bacterial repopulation of pockets after scaling and root planing. However, mobile teeth in human harbor significantly a higher proportion of Compylobacter rectus and Peptostreptococcus macros than the non-mobile teeth. We will discuss two concepts that explain the effect of trauma from occlusion on the attachment of the periodontia. Number one is the Glickman's concept. Glickman and Smolo proposed the theory in the early 1960s that traumatogenic occlusion may act as a cofactor in the pro uh, pro uh, progression of periodontitis, and this theory is known as the co-destructive theory. Glickman claimed that a force of an abnormal magnitude are acting on teeth harboring subgingival plaque, then the allay of the spread of the plaque-associated gingival lesion can be altered. In periodontal structure, they divide the periodontal structure divided into two zones. The zone of irritation, the zone of irritation, which consists of the marginal interdental gingiva, the soft tissue zone surrounded by hard structure, which is the tooth on one side, and has no impact by occlusal forces. This means that gingival inflammation cannot be initiated by trauma from occlusion due to the irritation, but it is due to the irritation of the plaque at the zone of irritation. The other zone is the zone of co-destruction, which is consists of periodontal ligament, cementum, and alveolar bone. 
and is coronally delineated by the transeptal and dentoalveolar collagen fiber bundles. Become periodontitis, plaque induced inflammation enters the zone that is influenced by the occlusion. As we mentioned, it is the zone of co destruction. The other concept is the Warhawk concept. Warhawk and Kickman both has examined autopsy specimen, but Warhawk also measured the distance from the subgingival plaque to the periphery of the associated inflammatory cell infiltrate in the gingiva and the adjacent alveolar bone. He came to conclusion that angular bony defect and also the infrabony pocket occur equally a periodontal size which are unaffected by trauma from occlusion like in traumatized teeth. In other words, he refuted the hypothesis that trauma from occlusion played a role in the spread of gingival lesion into the zone of co-destruction. The loss of the connective tissue attachment and resorption of the bone around the teeth are according to Warhawk exclusively the result of inflammatory lesion associated with subgingival plaque. Warhawk concluded that angular bony defects and infrabony pockets occur when the subgingival plaque of one tooth has reached a more apical level than the microbiota and the neighboring tooth and when the volume of the alveolar bone surrounding the roots is comparatively large. There, will, there are many studies done to induce trauma from occlusion on animal basis and come to exclusively explain the effect of trauma from occlusion on the periodontium. The main Two are the Eastman Dental Center Group in Rochester and the University of Gothenburg Group in Sweden. The first in Rochester, New York, used sequel monkeys produced trauma by repetitive interdental wedging and added mild to moderate gingival inflammation. Experimental time were 10 weeks. They reported that the presence of a trauma didn't increase the loss of attachment induced by periodontitis. The second group, the Gothenburg group in Sweden, used buccal dogs, produced trauma by placing cups, splints, and orthodontic appliances, and induced severe gingival inflammation. Experimental time were one week, one year. Up to one year, and this group found that occlusal stresses increase the periodontal destruction induced by periodontitis. When trauma from occlusion is eliminated, a substantial reversal of bone loss occurs, except in the presence of periodontitis. This indicates that the inflammation inhibits the potential for bone regeneration. Thus, it is important to eliminate marginal inflammation, affect bone regeneration after the removal of a traumatizing contact. This has been also shown in experimental animals that trauma from occlusion doesn't induce progressive destruction in the periodontal tissue in regions that are kept healthy after the elimination of pre-existing periodontitis. Trauma from occlusion also tends to change the shape of alveolar crest. The change consists in form of widening of the marginal periodontal ligament, narrowing of the interproximal alveolar bone, and shelf life thickening of alveolar margin. Therefore, although trauma from occlusion doesn't alter the inflammatory process, it changes the architecture of the area around the inflamed site and thus in the absence of inflammation the response to trauma from occlusion is limited to adaptation to the increased force while in the presence of inflammation 
the changes in the shape of alveolar crest may be conducive to angular bone loss and existing pockets may become intrabony. The other theories that have been proposed to explain the interaction of trauma from occlusion and inflammation include the following. Trauma from occlusion may alter the pathway of extension of gingival inflammation to the underlying tissue. And this may be favored by the reduced collagen density and increased number of leukocytes, osteoclast, blood vessels and uh, in the coronal portion of increasingly mobile teeth. Inflammation may then proceed to periodontal ligament rather than to the bone. Results in bone loss would be angular and pocket could be intrabony. The other explanation that trauma-induced area of root resorption uncovered by apical migration of the inflamed gingival attachment may offer a favorable environment for the formation and attachment of a plaque and calculus, therefore may be responsible for the development of deeper lesions. Third, supragingival plaque can become subgingival if the tooth is tilted orthodontically or if it migrates into the edentulous area, which results in the transformation of the suprabony pocket uh, to, make, uh, to make it intrabony pocket. Increased mobility of a traumatically losing teeth may have a pumping effect on plaque metabolites, thereby increasing their diffusion. The clinical signs of a trauma from occlusion alone. The most common clinical sign of trauma from occlusion to the periodontium is the increased tooth mobility. During the injury stage of a trauma from occlusion, the destruction of the periodontal fibers occur, which increase tooth mobility. During the final stage of the accommodation of the periodontium to increased force entails a widening of the periodontal ligament, which is also lead to increased tooth mobility. Although this teeth mobility is greater than the so-called normal mobility or the physiologic mobility, it cannot be considered pathologic because it is the adaptation and not a disease process. If it does become progressively worse, it can then be considered pathologic. Other causes of increased tooth mobility include the advanced bone loss, inflammation of the periodontal ligament of uh, periodontal or periapical origin, and some systemic disease as in a pregnancy. The, uh, the destruction of the surrounding alveolar bone, such as occur with osteomyelitis, jaw tumor may also increase the tooth mobility. Increase width of periodontal ligament space, often with thickening of the lamina dura along the lateral aspect of root, in the apical region, and in the bifurcation area. These changes do not, do not necessarily indicate a destructive changes because they may result from thickening and strengthening of the periodontal ligaments and alveolar bone constituting a favorable response to increased occlusal forces. Other clinical signs of trauma from occlusion is the frimitus, pain, tooth migration, attrition, muscle and joint pain, fractures and chipping of the tooth structure. The radiographic changes of trauma from occlusion. The increased width of periodontal ligament space and the thickening of the lamina dura along the lateral aspect of root and in the apical region and in the bifurcation area, but these changes are not indicate a destructive changes because it may result from the thickening of the periodontal ligament and the alveolar bone, which is the uh, favorable response to increase occlusal force. Other radiographic signs are the 
vertical rather than a horizontal destruction in the interdental septum, radiolucency and condensation of the alveolar bone, and root resorption. The thickening of the periodontal ligament space, mainly in the apical and the forcation area, root resorption, hypersementosis, these are the most radiographic findings of trauma from occlusion. We have another effect of the trauma from occlusion or the force of occlusion on the periodontium is the pathologic tooth migration, which is referred to tooth displacement that results when the balance among the factors that maintain physiologic tooth position is disturbed by periodontal disease. Pathologic migration is relatively common, and it may be an early sign of disease, or it may occur in association with gingival inflammation, pocket formation, as uh, in the disease progressor, progressing. Pathologic migration occurs most frequently in the anterior region. But posterior teeth may also be affected. The teeth may move in any direction and the migration is usually accompanied by mobility, rotation, and rotation. Pathologic migration in the occlusal or incisal direction is termed as extrusion. All degree of pathologic migration are encountered and one or more teeth may be affected. It is important to detect the migration during its early stage and to prevent more serious mm -hmm. involvement by eliminating the causative factor. Even during the early stage, some degree of bone loss will occur. Pathogenesis of pathologic tooth migration. Two major factors play a role in maintaining the normal position of teeth. Health and normal height of the periodontal ligament apparatus, the force exerted on the teeth. The force exerted on the teeth include the force of occlusion, pressure from the lips, cheeks, tongue, and the factor that are important in relation to the force of occlusion include the following. A tooth morphologic feature, cusp inclination, the presence of full complement of teeth, physiologic tendency toward visual migration, the nature and location of the contact point relationship, proximal, incisal, and occlusal attrition, the axial inclination of the teeth. Alteration in any of these factors start an interrelated sequence of changes in the environment of a single tooth or a group of teeth that may result in pathologic migration. Thus, the pathologic migration occur under condition that weaken periodontal support or that increase or modify the forces exerted on teeth or both. The force that moves the weakly supported tooth by the created by factors such as occlusal contact or pressure from the tongue. It is important to understand that abnormality of pathologic migration rests with the weakened of periodontium. The force itself is not necessarily abnormal. Force that are acceptable to an intact periodontium become injurious when periodontal support is reduced, as in tooth with abnormal proximal contact. The abnormally located proximal contact converts the normal anterior component of the force to a widening force that causes occlusal or incisal movement of the teeth. The tooth to extrude when the periodontal support is weakened by disease. 
as its position change, the tooth is subject to abnormal occlusal force, which is aggravates the periodontal destruction and the tooth migration. Pathologic migration may continue after the tooth no longer contacts its antagonist. The pressure from the tongue or food bolus during mastication and proliferating granulation tissue will provide these forces. The pathologic migration is also an early sign of localized aggressive periodontitis, weakened by loss of support, uh, periodontal support. The maxillary and mandibular anterior incisors drift labially and extrude, thereby creating diastema between the teeth. The changes in the forces exerted on the teeth. Changes in the magnitude, direction, frequency of the force exerted on teeth can induce the pathologic migration of tooth or a group of teeth. These forces do not have to be abnormal to cause migration if the periodontia is sufficiently weak. Changes in the forces may result from unreplaced missing teeth or, rather, or uh, the other causes. The other causes include trauma from occlusion, pressure from the tongue, and pressure from the granulation tissue of the periodontal pockets. When the tooth support has been weakened by periodontal destruction, pressure from the granulation tissue of periodontal pockets has been mentioned as a contributing to the pathologic migration. The teeth may return to their original position after the pockets are eliminated, but if more destruction has occurred on one side of a tooth than on the other, the healing tissue tends to pull in the direction of the less destruction. The treatment outcome of periodontal trauma from occlusion. It include reduce and eliminate the tooth mobility, eliminate the occlusal prematurity and primitus, eliminate parafunctional habits, prevent further tooth migration, decrease and stabilize the radiographic changes. The therapy for trauma from occlusion include when we have primary trauma from occlusion. Treatment modal modalities include the selective grinding, habit control, orthodontic movement, and interocclusal appliances. While when we have a secondary occlusal trauma, we may apply splinting of the teeth, selective grinding, and orthodontic movement. Thank you. Hopeful to be, uh, I hope to be a useful lecture. Thank you.